Today we look at the final judge in our study of the judges of Israel, Samuel. You know, we started this series way back in January, looking at some of the early judges in the book of Judges. From there we moved to the live teaching tour. Remember that? Abimelech, Deborah, Jephthah, and Gideon. We did those live on every single campus. Then from there, in June, remember, we went to the man cave. Stories from the man cave. We dug in to the story of Samson. Today, we move to Samuel. Samuel is the last judge. Next week, we will be live at all campuses again as we look at the story of Saul. Samuel anoints a king for Israel, moving Israel from a theocracy to a monarchy. Israel wanted a king. They chose Saul. Samuel anointed him. I'll be back the following week to wrap up this series as we look at the first three kings in Israel. Saul, David, and Absalom. One was chosen by the people, one was chosen by God, and one chose himself to be king. We will literally land back right to where we started. Judges 21, verse 25, where it said, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Today I'm excited to introduce to you to our guest teacher, Heather Zempel. I met Heather years ago through Dave Buring, our friend here at Northway, who runs Lion's Share. He helps churches across the country become disciple-making churches. Heather speaks at his gatherings. Heather also speaks at large, well-known, respected national conferences all across the nation, conferences such as Orange and Catalyst. Heather is on staff at National Community Church in Washington, D.C. They are a multi-site church like Northway. They have seven campuses around the D.C. area. On staff there, Heather leads the discipleship ministries, also small groups. She leads this emerging leader ministry that is pouring into young men and women that are considering church ministry as a career. And then she also serves alongside senior pastor Mark Batterson as a member of their teaching team. She is the author of three books, Sacred Roads, Community is Messy, and Amazed and Confused. Currently, I'm reading Amazed and Confused. It's based on the book of Habakkuk, and it truly is amazing. She has a master's in biological engineering. What in the world is that, and who would do such a thing? She loves exploring good barbecue joints around Capitol Hill, where she lives with her husband, Ryan. She is one of my favorite authors and teachers. She is a true friend of Northway Christian Community. Church. So across all of our campuses, will you give a warm welcome to Heather Zempel. Thank you so much, Pastor Scott. Thank you so much for those words. Uh, You know, words are incredibly powerful. Uh, And misunderstood words can actually be very detrimental. For instance, misunderstood music lyrics just make you sound like an idiot in the car. You know, when you sing the, the wrong words. Uh, misunderstood instructions can make you look incompetent. Uh, misunderstood directions can leave you lost. Here's, let me just give you a little insight in my life. Um, my mom and I were on a little vacation in Newfoundland, Canada a couple of years ago. And uh, on that particular day, we, we got up and we decided that we wanted to go on an adventure to Cape Race. Now, Cape Race is known for being the lighthouse that uh, the Titanic signaled to when it hit the iceberg. And so uh, we wanted to go to Cape Ray, see the lighthouse, and uh, it's a very rocky, uh, difficult road to get to the lighthouse. And so uh, we popped not just one tire, but two on our car. And uh, the very, very nice lady at the Welcome Center at the Cape Race uh, uh, area gave us directions to the closest auto mechanic in uh, about 50 miles. Of where we were. And so, you know, we put the little little donut spare thing on there and, and we set out. And, and what Carol told us was, now you want to go right here and take a left. And because I'm a little bit directionally challenged, I repeated those words to her. I said, okay, so, so you're saying we go right here and then we take a left. And she goes, exactly, you go right here and you take a left. So I get in my car with my mom, who's more directionally challenged than I am, and we go out of the parking lot, we take a right, and then we take the next left, and we're looking for this auto shop. Now, I'm really confused about these directions, though, because when I looked at the map, it sure seemed like we needed to be going west instead of east. And it also seemed like the water that was to our left really needed to be on our right. 
And we kept driving, and we kept driving, and we kept driving. And the further we went, the more I replayed that conversation in my head. And what I began to realize is that the, word, the use of the word right was different than the way I'd heard it. See, I had heard go right here and take a left. What wonderful Canadian Carol meant was right, not a direction, but in this place right here. Like, just go right here and take a left. She was like, go right here, right at the, at, the, at the end of the parking lot and take a left. So we'd gone like 20 minutes in the wrong direction. So misunderstood words can leave you completely lost. Uh, but what I've understood too is that misunderstood words not only leave you lost geographically, they can also leave you lost theologically. I grew up in a Southern Baptist church in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, so I grew up, you know, kind of, I was spit out on the church pew. My dad was a deacon. My mom was a Sunday school teacher. My earliest memories are in the church. And uh, one of the hallmarks of the, the service in the Baptist church is the altar call at the end. Pastor preaches the word, invites people to come forward to start a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there are these songs that are, that are imprinted on my memory from, from those days. You know, uh, Jesus paid it all. Um, I have decided to follow Jesus. I surrender all. In fact, I surrender all is one of the songs I remember singing the most. But what was really disturbing for me and confusing to me as a five-year-old kid in those church services was what in the world Jesus needed our all for. Because you see, in Mobile, Alabama, when somebody talks about all, they're talking about something that you drill for in the Gulf of Mexico or you change in your car every three months or every 3,000 miles, whichever comes first. I couldn't figure out why Jesus needed my all. Why did he need my oil? And I'm thinking, well, I mean, you know, the, the wise men brought him, you know, gold and frankincense and myrrh, so maybe oil kind of goes in there. And it, it was several years before I realized, no, all, A-L-L, not O-I-L. So words can leave you really kind of messed up. And so the words that are most important in our lives, we need to make sure, sure that we hear most clearly and correctly. Now, if you've got your Bibles with you this weekend, if you'll turn over to 1 Samuel 3 and just kind of hang out there, we'll get there in just a few moments. And I just want to say a welcome across all of our campuses this weekend, from Dormont to East End to Oakland, Sewickley Valley and Wexford. So excited that I get to be with you. I'm so grateful for the words that some of your leadership have spoken into my life. Pastor Kent, Pastor Doug, Pastor Scott have been a huge influence on my life. Words are so powerful, and, and, and words from God have the, the, this ability to, to create and shape history. Let me just kind of back up all the way to the beginning and talk about the way that the words of God have shaped who we are and where we've come from and where we're going I mean, the words of God are so powerful that in the beginning, God created with a word. And at the sound of his voice, galaxies were hurled into orbit. Light beamed from heaven, waters covered the earth, mountains sprung high, valleys dug deep, birds flew in the air, fish swam in the sea, insects crawled on the ground, and dinosaurs thundered across the land. And God said, it is good. And it took us like three chapters to mess it all up. But God had placed the man and the woman in a garden that was filled with trees, trees that were beautiful to look at with fruit that was delicious to eat. And he said just of, of one, the one in the middle there, don't, don't eat that. But Adam and Eve believed a different word. The thief, the villain, the, the, the one who steals the souls of men came crawling into the garden in the form of a serpent and put a seed of doubt in the woman and said, did God really say that? And they reached for the very thing that caused them to forfeit the life that they were created to live. They were removed from the garden. They were banished. But God spoke again. And he gave distant glimpses of redemption. He spoke and said that redemption was already in the works, that one day the offspring of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And he gave distant glimpses of the Messiah. 
And then you fast forward several years and he shows up to a man named Abram and he speaks again and he tells this man, I will make you a great nation and through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And the age of the patriarchs began from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, from miraculous provisions of rams caught in the thicket to all night wrestling matches with God. God continued to speak his promises from generation to generation to generation. Then you fast forward 400 years and the people of God find themselves enslaved in Egypt and God begins to speak again, this time from a burning bush. And he speaks to a man named Moses and he, he raises up Moses to be his mouthpiece to Pharaoh in which he says, let my people go. And in a miraculous, unimaginable, unbelievable event, the people of God are released from slavery. They cross the Red Sea. They find their way into the wilderness. And once again, God speaks. And this time, his words take physical shape on stone tablets. The Ten Commandments are given as a code, a way of life for the people of God to live. And Moses writes down the words of God in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers to give people a pathway of righteousness and relationship with God. But the people refused to listen to those words. They longed for the words that they remembered in in Egypt. And so they were doomed to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years later, Moses wrote another book, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy was written to a new generation of Israelites that didn't remember Egypt. It was written to remind them of who they were, whose they were, where they were going, why they were going there, and how they were to live once they got there. And under the leadership of Joshua, they go into the promised land. And once they get to the promised land, once they settle it, they kind of begin to settle. And once again, they forget the words of God. In fact, we're told in in the book of Judges that another generation grew up that did not know the Lord nor remember his mighty acts on behalf of Israel. And so God raised up the judges to speak his words, to administer wisdom and truth and leadership. People like Othniel and Gideon and Deborah and Samson led the people of God, but there was this vicious cycle that we would see that people did what was right in their own eyes and we get to the end of the book of Judges, the last verse that Israel was at without a king and so everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And you turn the page and a new story starts with the last judge of Israel, a man by the name of Samuel. And Samuel's story is really interesting because what scripture does is give us a snapshot of his life from birth to death. Uh, We find in the beginning of 1 Samuel, his mother, Hannah, in the house of the Lord at Shiloh. This is before the temple was built. And so the tabernacle was set up in Shiloh and she's in, in that tabernacle in the presence of God praying. She'd wrestled with infertility for years. And she's praying to God to give her a child. And Eli, the priest, comes in and with great discernment says to her, woman, get out of here. You're drunk. You shouldn't be in the presence of God. And she says, "Uh, I'm not drunk. I just really, really want a child. I'm grief stricken. And then they have this conversation and and Hannah promises that if if she has a child that she'll dedicate him to the service of the Lord. Sure enough, Samuel is born. She brings him to the tabernacle, dedicates him, gives him in service to the Lord. And Eli kind of becomes his boss. And we pick this story up in 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now, this is a little long, so just stick with me for a second, all right? And uh, if you don't have Bibles with you this weekend, we'll, we'll throw them up on the screen. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now, in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite uncommon. One night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. Suddenly, the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. 
And Samuel got up and went to Eli, here I am, did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said, go back to bed. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time. And once more, Samuel got up and went to Eli, here I am, did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, go and lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. And the Lord came and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, speak, your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I'm about to do a shocking thing in Israel. Now, let's stop right there for a moment. I think this story's really funny. I mean, I don't really understand why God didn't just the first time say, Samuel, this is God. I know this is a new thing for you, but I have a message. Like, I kind of have this picture in my head of the angels in heaven kind of snickering through this whole thing. This poor kid gets up and runs to Eli three times before he realizes that, oh, it's, it's God speaking to me. And, and one observation I make about this passage is that it, it, it seems that there are times that God's voice sounds very similar to our voices. I mean, Samuel thought it was Eli calling him. I always tend to think that when God speaks, it's with this loud, booming, reverberating um, tone and tenor of like James Earl Jones. You know? But maybe his voice doesn't sound that different from all the voices around us, which is why it's so important that we train ourselves to hear him. That in order to hear him above and through all the other voices in our world and in our lives, we've really got to learn to know what it sounds like. Another thing that I, I notice about this passage is that there's something about being in the presence of God that allows us to hear him speak. Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle in, in the place where, um, where the ark of God was kept. Sometimes it's called the Ark of the Covenant. It's where the Ten Commandments were and, and the rod of Aaron and the bowl of manna. It was a reminder to the people of God's provision and deliverance and sovereignty and faithfulness. And it also marked the presence where his presence was and that's where Samuel was sleeping. Samuel was intentionally posturing himself in a place where he's close to God's presence I think if we want to hear the voice of God, we've got to realize that being in his presence is a prerequisite to hearing his voice. And we have to intentionally, strategically, relentlessly pursue his presence. And the third thing I, I just kind of notice about this passage is we have to respond. When we hear God speak, we have to, there has to be some response to that, some invitation to hear more. Samuel said, here I am, I'm, I'm listening, your servant is ready. Are we in a posture that's willing to receive whatever he has to say to us? And then God says, I'm about to do something shocking in Israel. Now, can I just let you know that when God says something like that, that's a little bit of a red flag. Um, in fact, a lot of times when God speaks verbally, audibly to people in the Bible, it's not news that you really want to hear. So, for instance, um, in, in the book of Habakkuk, when, when God tells the prophet, uh, look at the nations and be amazed, I'm going to do something in your day that no one will even believe, even if they were told. Like, I'd get really excited about that. Like, God's about to do something really awesome and exciting. And then the next words out of his mouth are, the Babylonians are coming in to destroy you. You think about Daniel having to carry a message from God to the king. Your days are numbered. You've not passed the test. You're going to die. You're going to lose your kingdom. Or you're Abraham, and God's told you, pack up your family, go to a place that I'll show you. And you go to your family, you say, hey, guys, God says we got to move. Where are we moving? I, I, I don't know. Well, how long is it going to take to get there? Um, I don't know. Abraham, how are you going to know once we're there? I don't know. 
mean, you think about Jeremiah being given a, a word from the Lord to tell the people, submit to your captors. The word of, the God, word of God comes to Hosea, marry a prostitute. How do you explain that to your family? And so God says to Samuel, I'm going to do something shocking in Israel. And just like all of these other people, it's not a pretty message. What God tells Samuel, and, and, and the Jewish historian Josephus said that it's believed that Samuel was about 12 years old when this happened. This 12-year-old kid is given a message, his first message from God, that his boss's family is about to bite the dust. That he is displeased with Eli and Eli's sons, and their line, their leadership, their influence is about to come to an end. Great. God speaks to you, says something to you, shows up in the middle of the night and speaks, and that's the message you have to carry. One of the things I've noticed in my own life is that a lot of times I really want God to, to tell me stuff. Like, I want God to give me information and direction. Like, I, I seek that out. I want to know God's will. I want to know what he's saying to me. But what, I, what I've noticed is I've done this, you know, for a few years is that a lot of times when I ask God for direction, I'm just asking him that so I can kind of consider it. Like, I want God to give me direction and information so I can think about it. So I can hold it up against all my other options and weigh them out and judge which one I'd rather do. You know, God, tell me what you want my uh, life to look like. Okay, thanks, I'll consider that. And what I've learned when I read scripture is that God does not give us information or direction for our consideration or our contemplation or our deliberation, but for our activation. He doesn't give us direction so we consider it, can consider it. He gives us direction so we can be obedient to it. God's words give us direction for activation. And so 12-year-old Samuel is walking around with this message that God has called him to be faithful to, has called him to be a steward of. He gets up the next morning, and when Eli asks him what did the Lord say, he had to be faithful to carry the words that God had given to him even though it could have come at personal cost. God's words give us direction, but they're meant for our activation. And as we skip down, we read in, in verse 19, as Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. And all Israel from Dan to the north, I'm sorry, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and gave messages to Samuel there at the tabernacle. All of his words proved to be reliable. One translation says that none of his words fell to the ground. I think that that's just really interesting imagery. None of his words fell to the ground. Samuel, because he was faithful with what God had given to him, became very, very influential. Because God's words were so powerful in his life, his words became powerful in the world around him. I think a lot of times we try to find our voice and make our voice be heard, but what we really need is to hear God's voice. If we'll be careful to posture ourselves in the presence of God, he will position us where we need to be. God's words are given for direction, for activation, for obedience. And because Samuel was faithful at this point when he was a kid, God positioned him where he needed to go later in life. If we'll activate the words that God has revealed to us, it will accelerate the formation of character that we need. The character that will sustain the calling he's placed on our lives for the long haul. Now I'm going to skip forward a little bit and look at two other places where God directly spoke to Samuel. The next one's going to be in 1 Samuel 8, so if you want to turn over there you can do that. Um, to fill in the gap of what happens, uh, Samuel's words did come to pass, uh, or God's words came to pass. Eli's sons were killed in a skirmish with the Philistines. Eli died upon uh, receipt of this news. And, um, and this cycle kind of starts again of people just falling away from the words of God. And, and they begin to look around at other nations 
nations around them and, and said, you know, we want to be more like them. And they went to Samuel and they demanded that they be given a king. And so in 1 Samuel 8 verse 6, we read this, Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Now, this was a huge blow to Samuel. This is a rejection of his leadership. It's a rejection of his influence. They're saying, we don't want this whole judges set up thing anymore. We want a king, so give us a king. And I think it's just really interesting. I, I feel like we see a little bit of God's mercy and compassion in this exchange he has with Samuel because like the first thing he says to Samuel is, hey, look, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. They're not rejecting you. You keep doing what I've called you to do. I think we need to make sure that we let God's words establish our worth. This story is yet another example of how popular opinion is both fleeting and flawed. Your greatest fans and your greatest critics are probably both wrong. We need to let the words of God establish our character and our worth and whatever authority or influence we might have. Because if we let people establish that, it can change at an awfully fast rate as popular opinion changes. If we, if we look to others to give us our value, we usually walk away in one of two sinful postures. If we let people establish our worth and they praise us, we can walk away prideful. If we let people establish our worth and they're critical, we can walk away playing the comparison game or walking in jealousy of others. If we let God establish our worth, if we let the words that he speaks over us tell us who we are and whose we are and what we're about, then that becomes certain and unchanging. And if you don't know where to start with that, I, I would just encourage you to start in the book of Ephesians. If you open up the book of Ephesians, like all throughout that book, it tells us who we are in Christ. Because of Christ, we are. In him, we are. In Christ, we have. That might be a great place to start, to just say, God, what, what is my worth? What is my value? Who have you made me to be? God's words establish our worth. The other thing that's, that's interesting to me, you know, to go back to this whole, like, God's words are for direction and for activation, like, Samuel immediately does what the people demand and what God says for him to go ahead and do. If I'd been Samuel, I probably would have gone to Saul and said, hey, you're the next king, uh, and that'll start when I die. <laughs> but he didn't do that. Even though it came at personal cost, a personal offense, he immediately obeyed the direction that he was given. Delayed obedience is disobedience, ultimately. And so when God gives direction, when God speaks, it's time for activation, and we need to let his words establish our worth. The next place we're going to go is 1 Samuel 16, just very quickly. So Saul is, is made king, and, and you guys are going to talk about that in a little bit more in depth next weekend. Um, but in summary, Saul was cowardly, he was impatient, he was arrogant, and because of that, God ultimately rejected him as king and told Samuel to go anoint another king and directs him to the house of Jesse. And so Samuel goes to Jesse's house and says, bring out all your sons, we're going to anoint a new king. And, and Jesse parades all of his boys in front of the prophet. And Samuel, given common sense and the cultural, the social custom, sees the, the firstborn and says, this has got to be the next king. This guy is impressive. And God says, no, not him. So he goes to the next son. He says, well, maybe this is the one. God says, no, he's not the one I've chosen. And on down the line, he goes, no, 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 no. And Samuel now is in this really embarrassing place because he's gone through all of Jesse's sons and God has said no to all of them. And like, he's prophet? Like, what is he missing? Like, what? I must have missed God's voice somewhere. 
And so he asked Jesse, are there any other sons? And he says, well, there's the, the young punk out with the sheep. And Samuel says, well, get him in here. And immediately Samuel anoints him the next king of Israel. God's words are much greater than our wisdom. If we rely on our experience, our wisdom, we will miss it. Samuel didn't rely on his common sense or the social custom to anoint the king that made the most sense to him. He waited on the words of God to be spoken and obeyed those. God's words are much, much greater than our wisdom. Now, I don't know what would have happened if any of those other boys had become king of Israel, but here's what happened with David, with the runt, the young punk who was out watching the flocks. David was a poet, a musician, a warrior, a king. David was responsible for unifying what was a loose confederation of tribes into a very powerful national force. He established Jerusalem as the center of political life and social life and religious life. He wrote up the job descriptions for the Levites and wrote up the plans for the temple. He expanded Israel's territory by a factor of 10. He conquered the Jebusites and the Syrians, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, a lot of ites. He wrote 70 psalms. I start feeling lazy when I think about all the accomplishments of David. And all of this happens because Samuel is willing to rely on the words of God over his own wisdom. Trust the words of God. They are greater than our own wisdom. So the story of Samuel shows us some very important things. That we've got to posture ourselves in the presence of God because that is a prerequisite to hearing his voice. We have to aggressively, strategically, intentionally, relentlessly pursue that place. And that once we hear God's words, God's words give direction. And they're meant for activation, not just consideration. That we can let God's words establish our worth and our value. And that God's words ultimately are much, much greater than our wisdom. So how do we do this thing? You know, it seems in the Old Testament that God spoke clearly to particular people at particular times for particular reasons. And then Jesus comes and everything kind of explodes. The Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost and and it's said that, you know, the Holy Spirit will now be poured out on all people. Jesus says, I know my sheep, my sheep know my voice, they listen to me, and they follow me. Jesus is wanting to speak to all of his kids. And so how do we do that? If Jesus wants to speak to us, then where do we start? I I would say the first thing we do is we start with the Bible. (laughs) I mean, he's already spoken, And I think if we're wanting to hear direction from God, if we're wanting to hear the voice of God, we've got to start right here. I mean, if if we're not in our Bibles, then we can just stop asking God to speak to us. He's like, it's over there on your nightstand. Start there. I also think that when you you read the pages of Scripture, it, it gets your ears in tune with what his voice sounds like. We can begin to recognize God's voice and hear it above all others when we immerse ourselves in the words he's already spoken. I believe God also speaks to us in prayer. He did that with Peter and with Paul and so many in the early church. Prayer was never meant to be a one-way monologue, just a dump of what is on our brain to God. It was meant to be a conversation. In prayer, do we pause long enough to actually let God get a word in? So maybe for some of us this week, it's just a matter of, in our prayer time, pausing and letting God's voice enter the conversation. I think a third way that God speaks to us is through relationships, through people, through the counsel of others. I can't go into it now, but King Josiah had the prophetess Huldah. King Hezekiah had Isaiah. Paul had Silas. Over and over in the Bible, we see people that come together to do ministry together, to do life together, to lead together, and God will use them to speak his word and his truth and confirm his word through other people. Who are you surrounding yourself with? 
One of my favorite preachers, um, Andy Stanley, once said, and I just ripped this right out of his teaching notes. He says, your friends will determine the quality and direction of your life. Sometimes we hear the words of the Lord through the friends that we surround ourselves with. Are we surrounding ourselves with people whose ears have been shaped and molded and impacted by the voice of God? Now, just some guidelines that I would, I would offer to you as we kind of come to a close this weekend. Um, these aren't mine. They, they come from friend and, and mentor uh, Dave Beering. But I use these. These are helpful to me. When, when I believe that God has spoken, when I believe that there are words of God that I need to, to discern, I'll use these guidelines. One, is it biblical? Does it line up with the truth that has already been revealed? Because the Bible, the scripture, is the foundation and the filter through which we judge every other word that we think that we've heard from God. Is it biblical? Number two, is it in line with God's character and ways? God is not going to tell you to do something that's out of line with his character. That's not consistent with his ways, the way that he goes about doing things. He's not going to speak a word that encourages you to do something out of pride instead of humility, out of selfishness instead of compassion. Is it in line with the character and the ways of Jesus? Does it glorify Jesus and draw people to him? The word that you believe you're hearing, does it glorify Jesus and draw people to him? Does it bear witness with you? Does it bear witness with those around you? That's kind of just that gut check thing. That when we're walking in the ways of God, we can just have this gut check that God has spoken. I believe that God desperately wants to speak to his people. He's spoken through, to his people through his word, and he wants to continue to speak to us today through his word, through prayer, through the counsel of others. And what we learn from the life of Samuel is it's, it's about posturing ourselves in his presence. And if we posture ourselves in his presence, he'll position us wherever we need to be. And his words can establish our worth. Instead of looking at the world around us that's constantly changing, with opinions that are constantly moving, let God in his unchanging nature and ways and word establish your worth and your value. And his words are much greater than our wisdom. Now, you may be here this weekend and, and you're thinking, you know, this is, this is great, but I don't even know where to start having a conversation with Jesus. I, I'm, I'm new to this thing or I'm coming back to this thing. If you're here this weekend and, and you've never come to that place where you've had conversation with Jesus or you have a relationship with Jesus, the words he would say to you this weekend are simply this, follow me. It's the first words that he spoke to his disciples. It's the words that he continues to speak today. God's words are still creating and shaping history. And I believe that this weekend there are people whose histories can be created and shaped by a word from God. And if you're here this weekend and, and you've never responded to Jesus saying, follow me, I encourage you, don't leave without talking to a campus pastor, without grabbing somebody that you came with, say, okay, if Jesus is really saying, follow me, I want to know how to respond to that. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for what you're doing here in, in Northway. I thank you um, for the way that, that your words have shaped and formed and molded the history of this church. God, I thank you that your voice is still speaking, that when you said, let there be light, that that contains so much power, that we're still trying to discover the extent of your creation. We're still trying to discover the extent of the power of your words. God, I pray that, those, that, that, that your words would be powerful in our lives this weekend. God, help us to tune our ears to your frequency that we would hear you, that we would respond to you, that we would let what you have to say take greater place in our lives than anything else we hear in the world. And God, if there's anybody here this weekend that needs to hear those words, follow me, I pray that your Holy Spirit would draw them 
God, that you would stir up in them a sense of excitement about the adventure of sharing the road with you, of following you. God, I pray that as we open up our our Bibles this week, that you would continue to speak to us so that we can grow in your character and in your ways and we can glorify you in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen.